the Meg, aka Megalodon, roamed the oceans long after dinosaurs were wiped out by the great meteorite. It was one of the largest and most dangerous hunters that have ever lived on Earth, as well as the biggest shark. But then, about 3.6 million years ago, the last of its kind disappeared from our planet, leaving only huge teeth for modern archaeologists to keep finding. There are a few theories about why it could have happened, but scientists might have found the true reason. The Megalodon, which means Big Tooth, was the largest shark ever to exist. It reportedly lived around 20 to 3.6 million years ago and was truly enormous. Its bite was more powerful than that of a T-Rex and likely any other powerful predator that has ever roamed this planet. It's probably not surprising since this marine creature had extremely strong jaws that could span from 9 to 10 feet wide. That's enough to swallow two grown-up people side by side. The jaws were also lined with 276 teeth, and they reached 7 inches in length. That's as long as a small hedgehog. Once these teeth got worn down, the shark got rid of them and grew new ones. Such large sedated teeth helped the Meg to eat meat easily. The shark itself could grow up to 59 feet long. That's twice the length of a London double-decker bus. The animal was also pretty heavy. While a fully grown T-Rex weighed about 8 tons, the weight of a large megalodon could be more than 30 tons. With no competitors, the enormous shark was the real king of the oceans. It hunted other sharks, large fish, and even whales. Then why did such a magnificent creature disappear from the face of the earth? The previous theories mentioned the great white shark. The megalodon is usually described as some gigantic version of this marine animal. And this is a common mistake made because most people think these creatures were related. But in reality, the Meg looked more like a modern bull shark. Its snout was snout, its lower jaw was rather flat, and long and massive pectoral fins supported the animal's weight. But what's more important, the ancestors of today's Great Whites existed at the same time as the Megalodon. Now, with great size comes great clumsiness. And although the Meg was huge and powerful, it was also not as nimble as smaller and quicker Great White Sharks. Great Whites could have rivaled a Megalodon for food, and were often more successful hunters thanks to their agility. They couldn't fight the Meg openly, but were fast enough to steal its food. So according to this theory, the only food left for the Megalodon were whales and equally big marine animals. Grown-up Megs could easily catch such beasts, but their offspring were much smaller and more vulnerable than their parents. Could smaller sharks have used this to their advantage? Maybe while Mega Sharks were still little, they became a meal for Great Whites as well as bull and tiger sharks. Even at those times, a great white shark could reach the length of 20 feet, while a megalodon kid was definitely smaller. But even if there had been no open confrontation between young megalodons and smaller grown-up sharks, meg kids wouldn't have been able to find food for themselves to grow to adulthood. The reason is the same. The population of other sharks was growing, and they were rivaling each other and the meg for convenient food. The more great whites and other sharks appeared in the oceans, the less food remained for young monster sharks. Eventually, they probably starved. But it's just one of the theories that try to explain why the Meg went extinct, and here's another one. A new study has shown that the Meg was most likely a warm-blooded predator able to regulate its body temperature, and that might have been the reason why this species disappeared with time. Scientists analyzed isotopes of the tooth enamel of the megalodon and concluded that the animal could easily maintain a body temperature that was around 13 degrees F warmer than the temperature of the surrounding water. Such a temperature difference is much greater than what other sharks living at the same time as the meg had, and it's large enough for the ancient predator to be classified as warm-blooded. These days, most fish are cold-blooded. Their body temperature is the same as the surrounding water, but some sharks, like mackerel sharks, keep the temperature of all parts of their bodies a bit warmer than the surrounding water. But it doesn't make them completely warm-blooded because they simply store heat generated by their muscles. And in mammals, body temperature is regulated by a special region of the brain called the hypothalamus. Anyway, the Meg's warmer body allowed the animal to move faster, deal with cold water better, and spread out all over the world. But eventually, it might have led to a disaster. The Megalodon lived during the Pliocene Epoch, pronunciation. It began approximately 5.3 million years ago and finished 2.5 million years ago. During that period, global cooling occurred. It also caused the changes in sea level, which the Megalodon probably didn't survive. 
The main problem for the predator was to maintain an energy level allowing its body temperature to remain elevated. But to do it, the animal had to eat a lot, and I mean it. But it was a challenging task in a time of changing marine ecosystems and while competing with newcomers, such as the great white shark. If this theory is true, then the amount of energy the Meg had to use to remain warm could have contributed to its extinction. This new information is very important to us. It shows that many marine predators in modern oceans might be experiencing the effects of ongoing climate change too. By the way, have you heard that there have been several cases when people were sure they had seen the Meg? Or at least some similar extremely large monsters. And these sightings happened relatively recently. For example, in July 1916, the New Jersey coast of the US was terrified by a series of shark attacks. They happened during an oppressive heat wave when hundreds of beachgoers tried to find shelter from the heat near the water. People described the culprit that had caused all that havoc as a giant shark, much bigger than any regular one. Since then, scientists have been debating which shark species was involved in those accidents. The most popular guesses have been the bull shark and the great white. A picture of a huge shark roaming the Pacific Ocean not far from Guadalupe Island appeared in 1999. The creature was nicknamed Deep Blue. It could be distinguished from others by a wavy pattern separating its gray back and white belly. But even though some people claimed it could be the infamous Megalodon, experts came to the conclusion it was a female white shark, the largest ever seen. The average length of a male white shark is 11 to 13 feet. Females are bigger, up to 15 or 16 feet, but Deep Blue reached more than 25th in length. No wonder people were confused. For the last time, Deep Blue was spotted in 2013 near the western coast of Mexico's Baja, California. But look, there's another jumbo shark, and you can meet it in any part of the world. The largest specimens can reach 40 feft long and weigh about 5 or even 6 tons. Could it be if not the Megalodon itself but one of its relatives? Again, a wrong guess. That's the basking shark. This animal prefers subpolar seas, with temperatures not higher than 58 degrees F. Even though some of these animals do migrate to warmer places. Like whale sharks, basking sharks are harmless and don't attack snorkelers or divers. These creatures have loads of small teeth, but they don't use them when feeding. Instead, they swim with their huge mouths open and swallow plankton. A grown-up basking shark can filter nearly 2,000 tons of water per hour. So, Megalodon was one of the biggest and most ferocious monsters on our planet. Powerful jaws, razor-sharp teeth, gigantic eyes. But what do you know about how it sounded? Imagine how loudly it growled, permeating the underwater world with sound vibrations. This sound resembled eh, nothing. Megalodon didn't have a voice. It was a shark, and sharks don't have sound-producing organs. It was a quiet danger. But despite its muteness, yes, that is a word, you could have still heard it. Come with me. Now you're under one, clenching your fist, raising your hand, and quickly bringing it down. Now imagine that you have a big submarine instead of a fist, and hear the water flowing around the smooth surface of the hull. That's what a megalodon sounded like. When this monster was swimming out to the surface and opening its jaws, it sounded like a waterfall. The giant shark swam at high speed. When the water was passing through its mouth and gills, it sounded like a flowing river, a fast, powerful river. Megalodon had no voice, only the scary sound of flowing water. Other ancient fish could make sounds, but you would hardly hear them. Whales, dolphins, and their distant ancestors are not counted because they're mammals. Fish communicated at frequencies elusive to human ears. They still have this ability, but in most, the ocean was and is a pretty quiet place. So let's get out on ancient lands and check what was going on with the sounds there. Thanks to modern technologies, scientists can analyze the sounds of many ancient animals. Using CT scans, they found that some dinosaurs had complex systems of small open pockets in their skulls. They used these winding cranial mazes to reproduce a wide range of sounds and regulate body temperature. And people have managed to hear them. 
an ancient bird that lived 79 to 140 million years ago. Vegasus sounded similar to some farm birds like duck and geese. But the ancient creature probably screamed in a scarier way. Scientists found this out thanks to the Shrinks fossil they discovered in 2016 in Antarctica. It's the oldest known vocal organ in the world. It helped Vegasus make a double humming sound coming from the left and right sides of the Shrinks. Imagine a duck and goose screaming. Increase the volume several times. Perhaps that's what its distant ancestors sound like. As for other flying reptiles like the pterodactyl, it couldn't scream like Vegasus because it didn't have a syrinx. These winged monsters could growl, hiss, and snap their beaks. And this was their most effective sound. Remember any tall basketball player? The skull of the pterodactyl was slightly longer than their height. Just imagine what a noise the dinosaur created when it was snapping its powerful beak. The clicking sound could deafen and frighten other ancient creatures nearby. Now, you probably know what a Tyrannosaurus sounds like, thanks to the movies. Among thousands of others, you'll recognize this prolonged roar similar to a chainsaw, vacuum cleaner, and horn. And, honestly, its roar has a lot in common with the natural sounds that this monster could make. Thanks to modern technologies and well-preserved remains, scientists managed to simulate the voice of these ancient animals. Imagine you're uploading data about a T-Rex into a program and preparing to hear an intimidating roar. You press play, and it sounds like a bee. Tyrannosaurus rex's scream was similar to birds, not mammals. But it wasn't just a bee. It used nostrils to scream, not a mouth. The hum came from the chest and resembled a siren with low bass. Maybe it sounded a lot more intimidating than what we saw in the movies. It was louder than all the trumpets of the symphony orchestra, and it did it only with the help of its nose. It's not known for sure whether it could growl through the mouth. You could also hear how long-necked dinosaurs sounded in the movies. Their calls were similar to those of elephants, something between a saxophone and a car horn. But in fact, these tall creatures whispered. Almost all mammals make sounds thanks to the laryngeal nerve. This nerve runs down along the neck, then goes around the blood vessels of the chest and comes back to the larynx. In short, the brain gives a signal and it passes twice the distance along the body before the sound is released from the mouth. And now, remember those long necks of dinosaurs? This was the height of a five-story building. But the voice signal had to run a distance of 10 floors. It took too long to make this long trip. And this affected the dinosaur's roar. So when they wanted to make a sound, they just hissed. And it was probably similar to the sound of a giant viper. But the most detailed sounds scientists have managed to get belongs to the Parasaur olephus. You know this herbivorous dinosaur thanks to the long crest on the back of its head. We saw the dinosaur using it in movies and documentaries to fight opponents and enemies. Some scientists believed it also used the comb to drop fruits and leaves from trees. Others thought the dinosaur used it to improve its sense of smell. But it turned out that in addition to self-defense and fighting, they used the comb to make loud and scary sounds in different keys. Scientists replicated this with fantastic accuracy thanks to the structure of its hard tissues. Almost all living beings with a voice use soft organs to make sounds. And these soft tissues decompose quickly. Parasar olefus had solid ones. They noticed tubes leading from the nostrils to the crest and back to the nostrils when they found the skull. It was like a crumb horn, a curved musical wind instrument. This proved the dinosaur used the crest on the back of its head to make the sounds louder. The comb allowed it to trumpet so its relatives could hear it in the forest. They made humming sounds with low and high notes. Mix a saxophone and trumpet with a goose hum, car horns, and low frequencies, then increase the volume several times. That's what Parasar Olefus sounded like. That's also what my fourth grade band sounded like. But I digress. You can listen to different shades and timbers of this dinosaur on the internet. It used noises with different tones to create complex social connections. They could communicate, identify each other, trumpet danger, or conversely, signal their friendly intentions. All right, we've just heard how some ancient reptiles sounded. But what about ancient insects? They didn't have vocal cords, of course. Instead, they used friction between body parts. 
Look at modern crickets chirping with their wings. One wing has tiny notches. The second has the shape of a mediator. Take a simple plastic comb and run your fingertip over its teeth. Crickets make their sounds by the same principle. Their wings vibrate and release a series of sound waves into the air. But the clicking of an ancient bush cricket was very different from modern insects since they were much noisier. The sounds of these clicks were like a whistle. With the help of high-frequency waves, they could also communicate secretly as if they were doing it through a closed radio channel. If you heard this, you would hardly be able to fall asleep to it. Now, modern crickets are not so loud as they began to add more high frequencies to their sounds. Higher pitch waves don't spread as far, reducing the risk that a bat will hear the insects. Just imagine how the jungle of that time sounded. The loud chirping of crickets hurts the ears. Then you hear a brachiosaurus hissing. The clicks of pterodactyls shake the sky like thunderclaps. Then you hear the trumpet sounds of different tones somewhere in the jungle. These are Parasaurolophus communicating with each other. And then you get scared by a loud Tyrannosaurus siren. What a racket! You'd probably not find peace in such conditions. Fortunately, humans appeared millions of years later. And by the way, scientists have managed to find out and understand what our distant ancestors sounded like. They carefully examined the insert function of the mouth, nose, and throat on the Neanderthal skeleton. Their voices were similar to ours, but the phonetic range of an adult Neanderthal was the same as if they were two to three years old. It was like mumbling without consonant sounds. The study of the skull couldn't recreate precisely the sound of Neanderthals. But in 2007, scientists extracted DNA samples from their bones. They found a variation of the gene that responds to human speech. Scientists believe that Neanderthals fought with Homo sapiens. You know, our family tree. As a result of this conflict, their kind became extinct. But the found gene points they could have had other connections with each other. Perhaps Neanderthals could understand their language and even pronounce some words. And now for some breaking news. All snakes have suddenly disappeared. If you saw this on the news, what do you think would happen? Well, Voldemort certainly wouldn't be pleased to hear this, and neither would other Slytherin members. Hogwarts would have three houses instead of four. Parseltongue, which is the language of serpents, would become useless. Okay, Potterheads, let's get back to our muggle world. How would it affect us? Well, let's look at the bright side first. People with Ophidiophobia, which is the fear of snakes, would be so relieved. We can all agree that snakes aren't exactly everyone's favorite animal. Some snakes are venomous, and this doesn't help save their reputation. It's often overlooked that these animals usually prefer to retreat when you encounter them. They can become defensive if threatened, but when left alone, they don't want to mess with you. Try telling this to people with a phobia, though. Now they can enjoy outdoor activities, such as mountain climbing, like everyone else. And yet, they would have other worries in the absence of these serpents. The design of the ecosystem works like a clock. Every species has an important role. If one goes down, the others will be affected. Snakes are no exception to this order. They primarily snack on mice or rats. They help to control rodent and other small mammal populations. This is important in terms of preventing the spread of diseases, too. Think about the spread of the plague of medieval times. Driving out all reptiles could cause a similar problem. Did you know that the bubonic plague was never completely gone? It's been spotted in modern times, too. For instance, in Madagascar in 2008, so it's good to have some snakes around to protect us from disease outbreaks. You see, snakes are excellent hunters. They ambush their prey by using their highly developed senses to find and track their potential dinner. They're super mobile, can squeeze through cracks, climb on rock walls, and swim. They can even fly. Well, sort of. Flying snakes can't actually gain altitude, but they can glide. They use the speed of free fall and contortions of their bodies to follow air flows and lift themselves. 
Yeah, they can catch their prey in numerous ways. If we imagine a world without them, it will lead us to another phobia. Allow me to introduce you to musophobia. It's the fear of mice and rats. People with this phobia will have a hard time with all those rats wandering around since there are no snakes to eat them. Not to mention that a single pair of rats can have a million descendants in over a year. Say hello to crop damage. An overpopulation of rodents can lead to a shortage of food and competition for resources. Do I feel the Hunger Games vibes? Oh, and mice wouldn't be our only problem. You can add insects to the list too. Again, without snakes, they'll throw a party in the streets. Reptiles also play an important role in the natural environment and food webs as prey. Mongooses, eagles, and hawks would really miss snakes. Eventually, some populations of large mammals would decline, and this could lead to the extinction of some species. Then there's medicine. Scientists and researchers would miss these creatures. Snake venom is the key to the development of certain medicines. For example, some diabetes and heart disease medicines have been derived from snake venom. Patients who need them will get affected too. When we mention snakes and medicine, there's something else that comes to mind. Botox. Is it really snake venom? Nope. Snake venom used in skin care isn't obtained from the animal itself. It turns out that this ingredient is called snake. It's a human-made ingredient designed to mimic the effects of temple viper snake venom. Now let's picture what life would really look like without snakes. I'm starting with day one. People don't immediately notice the absence of these creatures. So, in the first few days, especially in cities, people would have no clue that all snakes are gone. Workers in zoos could start to panic. You would see some news about snakes missing from zoos. Then people in zoo administrations would go through CCTV footage. They would be shocked to see that snakes disappeared into thin air. After the spread of this news, authorities would probably open special departments to see if they have any snakes left in their country. Then it would turn into a worldwide issue. Some sort of a global alliance would be established to investigate what happened to these reptiles and what could be done about it. By the time authorities and people understood the severity of the situation, ecosystems would already start to change. People who live in urban environments may not be directly affected in the first few months. Then they would see more mice in their houses and in the streets. Around 500,000 mice live in the network of tunnels of the London Underground, for example. The number may vary, but many rodents live in large cities. These animals would become more visible. You'd open a kitchen cabinet and, oops, you'd see a mouse looking at you from behind a jar of peanut butter. New career opportunities would arise, since the demand to live in a mouse-free environment would skyrocket. Authorities might introduce new taxes to raise money to handle this new situation. After all, they would need to provide people with safe places to live. Of course, it would be not only urban places that would be affected by the absence of snakes. The countryside would have even more problems. Without snakes, the number of pests would increase. These animals would start destroying crops and habitats of other animals, and farmers would be in serious trouble. Authorities would need to support people living there and find ways to protect the environment, which would be their top priority. Researchers and scientists would have to take a huge responsibility. Maybe they'd create artificial snakes that could be nutritious like real snakes, so that animals like eagles would hunt them and continue to live. What artificial snakes would look like is a mystery. I can't imagine them. I'll just leave it to you. If we flashed forward to five years from the first day of the world without snakes, we would face an entirely different world. Maybe we would have a special day for it, the fifth anniversary of the world without snakes. The changes would be obvious, but by that time, 
people would have probably got used to living in that different world. Some restaurants would have already made changes to their menus. Goodbye to snake soup. Then there would be new museums dedicated to snakes. You'd be able to read about the story of their evolution and see their fossils. Maybe you'd stop by the museum souvenir shop to buy a snake-shaped pen for your friend. Lastly, we would still be looking for alternatives to snake venom in the field of medicine. I mean, it's a relief for people who show allergic reactions to snake bites, but these animals are crucial for some studies and medicines. So, researchers would still be busy trying to find alternatives that could replace snake venom. If we went 200 years ahead in time, we would see a world where people have fully accepted that snakes are gone for good. So much so that younger people would only know that there was an animal named a snake that once lived on this planet. They would get to know this animal from history books and videos. Coloring books would have a cat or a dog, but not a snake. Mythical creatures like Medusa and Shamaran would become even more mystical and interesting. Oh, and we wouldn't compare a sneaky person to a snake anymore. There would be a new definition for them. We've survived the Ice Age, meteorites, and many other challenges, so we'll probably figure something out. Fingers crossed that this scenario never gets real, though. Do you have any other version of how events could unfold in a snakeless world? Dinosaurs are some of the most fascinating creatures to have ever walked Earth. It's a shame that we won't be able to have Jurassic Park, where we can see some of the coolest creatures come to life. But we are actually living with some creatures that are just as old as dinosaurs, such as crocodiles and sharks. They haven't changed much since they appeared millions of years ago. But most dinos didn't make it when the asteroid struck Earth. In a way, the asteroid was a giant reset button for the planet. After hitting Earth, this space traveler wiped out almost every living thing. The sky was covered with ash, which blocked out sun rays. That meant that plants couldn't grow. And this made a lot of herbivores, like, really hungry. As a result, they had to change their diet and adapt to the new changes. This forced some of those dinosaurs to take on a new path in life, turning into some modern animals we know today. If the asteroid had changed its course just a bit, then dinosaurs would have remained the dominant species. So, what would have happened if dinosaurs had stuck around? Well, first of all, evolution would have played out differently for them. Maybe during those millions of years, humans would not have evolved to be on top of the food chain. Imagine a world where dinosaurs still existed today. If dinosaurs had evolved as humans did, then we'd have to compete with them. There were multiple species of humans, but Homo sapiens, also known as us, prevailed. A humanoid dino or dinoid would be something strange. First of all, they would look different, more reptilian than us. Our brain sizes would differ, and they would be physically bigger and stronger. Putting a human and a dinoid side by side would be interesting. First of all, dinoids would have scales as opposed to human skin, and their teeth would be sharper. They would probably not have five fingers on each hand, and their nails would be sharp claws. Also, we don't know what they would sound like, but they'd possibly be guttural like crocodiles. Dinosaurs had very good vision compared to mammals, so it's possible we'd see dinoids with large eyes. The population of Earth has reached a staggering 8 billion people, and we've changed our environment to suit our needs. With that said, if dinoids were the dominant creatures, then the environment would be suited for them. Speaking of physical features, scientists predicted what dinoids would look like if they had evolved into intelligent creatures that walked upright and had opposable thumbs. These wiggly thumbs are important for evolution, since they helped humans start using tools for defending themselves and hunting. The creature may not look like the ideal reptile, and its appearance might not be flattering. But if dinosaurs had evolved, then these creatures could be your classmate or colleague at work. Not all dinosaurs were alike, as their fossils have shown. Some were gigantic, while others resembled any modern-day animal. 
The biggest land-walking dinosaur was the titanosaur, although the measurements are only rough estimates based on fossilized bones. It's estimated that the dino was around 122 feet long and lived between 100 to 95 million years ago. It was so massive that its weight was equivalent to 18 modern-day elephants. There were dinosaurs all over the world in different time eras, climates, and landscapes. However, only a handful were known as giants. But though they excelled in body size, they lacked in brain size. Some of the most well-known dinosaurs, like the Allosaurus and Stegosaurus, had very small brains, like me, which means it would have been nearly impossible for them to properly evolve into intelligent beings. Tell me about it. But in the late Cretaceous period, the T-Rex roamed the land. It had larger brains than its Allosaurus counterparts, which were millions of years behind. Even so, the T-Rex's brain only weighed just under a pound. A human brain is nearly 3 pounds. It might have been cool to see a T-Rex evolve into an intelligent being with opposable thumbs on its tiny stick hand. Contrary to popular belief, the T-Rex was actually quite slow, and a human could have easily outrun it. So, we know that these days, they wouldn't belong in any competitive sports that involve running. We know that dinosaurs could be herbivores and carnivores. But throughout their evolution, one thing remained the same. They had small brains. Other forms of dinosaurs were around too, such as long-legged and horned dinosaurs. Either way, they were on top of the food chain even when little mammals had cameo appearances. We have to consider that when the asteroids struck and wiped out dinosaurs, mammals took over the scene. If dinosaurs and mammals had shared the dominant position in the food chain and had followed a similar path in their evolution, then today's reality would be completely different than what we have now. Dinosaurs would have bigger brains and would compete with humans for the title of the smartest creature. One of the reasons why humans and parrots can talk is because of the strength and shape of our tongues. The evolved dinosaurs would have a different skull, shaped to fit such a tongue, if they wanted to talk like humans. One of the reasons why humans made it to where we are now is because we evolved to stand upright to detect predators. This was one challenge we had to overcome in order to survive. But what would dinosaurs need to challenge if they were already the most dominant creatures? Some of the big-brained dinosaurs had long legs which means they could run fast, detect predators, and grab food that otherwise would be beyond their reach. Their evolutionary path would be very different from that of humans, and maybe even more advanced. Their brains could have evolved into something impressive. They could turn out smarter than us and possess quicker reflexes. Imagine dinosaurs discovering gravity instead of Isaac Newton, or a dinosaur writing plays and poems better than William Shakespeare. Imagine dinosaurs possessing the creative knowledge to produce some of the finest art in history. Music and cinema would revolve around dinosaur culture, and fashion would look otherworldly. We would live in peace with dinoids, but we would certainly compete with them. The World Cup would feature dinosaurs and humans playing for their national teams, but clubs would be exclusively human or dinosaur. Some professions would be dominated solely by one species, and more physically demanding jobs would be taken by dinosaurs, like laborers and security guards. Eventually, dinosaurs would take over the world since they would be physically stronger than humans and would have better advantages than us. Humans, on the other hand, would need to figure out a way to keep up with dinosaurs. Mammals had a different path of evolution, where they never became gigantic super beasts as dinosaurs did. Instead, their brains developed and grew big. But even though humans are the smartest creatures on the planet, we don't have the biggest brain. Animals like orcas, whales, elephants, and other apes have bigger brains here. So why are we smarter than them? The answer is, we don't know. The brain is the most complex organ we have, and we know so little about it. We don't even know exactly why it's so complex or why it behaves like that. Today's dinosaur descendants, like crows and parrots, have complex brains, which allows them to communicate, use tools, and even count. Bigger doesn't always mean better in this case. A parrot's brain is smaller than a cat's, 
but it's far more complex and intelligent than that of any feline out there. Some scientists argue that dinosaurs from the movies aren't 100% accurate, and that they used to have feathers. In terms of evolution, some small feathered dinos might have followed the path of primates. They might have evolved into a tree-dwelling primate that may also have followed the path of becoming another species of human. They ruled the planet for over 170 million years and then disappeared. History says it was a huge city-sized asteroid that came from space and hit the land of the Yucatan Peninsula around 66 million years ago. It caused terrible environmental changes, debris in the air blocking the sunlight so the plants couldn't survive. Temperatures on Earth's surface plunged. The animals were struggling to survive until they finally went extinct. At least, that's something many paleontologists believe happened. Now, they found out dinosaurs were about to go extinct even before the asteroid. Their diversity started to go down 10 million years before the asteroid. Older, long-living species didn't evolve enough to adapt to all changes in the environment, such as higher sea levels, massive volcanic activity, cooler periods. Dinosaurs preferred a warm climate because it helped them to keep a stable body temperature. Dinosaurs lived on all seven continents, even in Antarctica. That's because it wasn't all ice back then. Around 90 million years ago, Antarctica was a swampy rainforest with a warm, pleasant climate. It was even in a different location, only 560 miles from the then South Pole. That was the time of the warmest climate on our planet. The sea level was 560 feet higher than today, and the tropical sea surface could reach temperatures up to 95 degrees. Antarctica still had something like polar night, months without sunlight, but the climate around the South Pole was mild and temperate, with no ice masses. Dinosaurs didn't shed their skin in one long piece like today's reptiles do. Scientists believe they shed it in small pieces, had something like dinosaur fur fur. There was a dinosaur, Pegomastax, that looked like a cross between a porcupine and a parrot. It had one-inch long jaws and ate plants. It had a short beak and self-sharpening long teeth. They were like scissors this small dinosaur used to slice up plants. Our modern lion has a mighty bite, but a big and scary T-Rex bites more than two times stronger. The king of the dinosaurs has the strongest bite amongst all land animals, three and a half times stronger than today's record holder, the Australian saltwater crocodile. It also had the longest teeth, almost 10 inches long, the length of an iPad. Most modern animals are either warm-blooded or cold-blooded. Dinosaurs were somewhere in between. Scientists think they mainly were mesotherms, which means the activity of their muscles could warm their bodies, but their body temperature could fluctuate too. Many dinosaurs, such as Triceratops and Stegosaurus, had spikes, plates, horns, crests, or other bizarre structures on their bodies. In the beginning, scientists thought that's for things like defense. They had neither sharp teeth nor hooked claws on the toes to hunt. But soon, they expanded the theory. It was probably a way to impress their mates and identify members of their kind. One species, namely Pachycephalosaurus, even had a funky bone hat on top of its head. Scary, tall as buildings, massive. That's what we saw in the movies. But dinosaurs mainly were human-sized or even smaller. Bigger bones were easy to be fossilized, so that's why we mostly find gigantic species. Eoraptor, or Dawn Stealer, was the first named dinosaur. Small and toothy, like me, it got its name because it comes from the dawn of the dinosaur age. The size of a German shepherd, but probably not that friendly. Arched back, sharp bony plates, curved tail. Ankylosaurus were some sort of giant, muck spikier dinosaur version of an armadillo. Its weak spot was a soft underbelly. But meat-eating dinos that were after this one had to flip that guy first to get there. Still, it was really tough because of their impressive gear. Scientists believe they even had bony eyelids. Some dinos ate meat, others plants. And some of them could nibble even on pebbles. One dinosaur, called Gallimimus, couldn't physically chew all those plants it ate, so it would ingest pebbles to mash up the food. Gallimimus looked like some weird alien mix of dinosaur and bird. But it couldn't dribble a basketball because its wrists weren't capable of keeping the palms parallel to the floor. 
and they had no three-point shot. The largest dinos were plant eaters. Meat eaters, or so-called theropods, were mostly smaller. When reason is that plant-eating dinosaurs were very greedy. They would devour enormous amounts of food, sometimes even swallowing the entire branches without chewing. Some of the biggest could eat a ton of food every day, like a bus-sized pile. There were also more plant-eating dinosaurs than the other ones. Scientists are still not sure if meat-eating dinosaurs were able to coordinate themselves in hunting groups. They were probably unfriendly towards each other, especially when it comes to sharing prey. Fossils and the shape of delicate bones in the eye tell dinosaurs mostly roamed around during the day. Scientists think only smaller meat-eating dinos, like Velociraptor, were active during the night. They were after those small mammals snuffling around and trying to find food while big dinosaurs were asleep. Or that's what they thought. Those small mammals were usually burrowing animals that survived both dinosaur reign and ice age hiding underground. Not all mammals were hiding from dinosaurs. Some small but sneaky creatures, like Repinomammus, would steal the eggs from big dinosaurs, which was a big thing considering they had to trick the mama dinosaur first. Researchers believe dinos tried to flap on the ground to get faster at running up inclined terrains to catch their prey. Such behavior caused them to learn how to fly, which of course happened through thousands of years. Dinosaurs were fuzzy and fluffy. They are related to birds, but even those early dino species that didn't fly had feathers, like gigantic, scary, fuzzy T-Rex. Movies lied. You just can't stand still and expect a T-Rex would pass you by. Its vision was probably better than one today's raptors have. Even without it, they still had a pretty good sense of smell. Running could help it, though. Scientists calculate T-Rex could probably run at 12 miles per hour. It would shatter its bones at a greater speed. Some dinos had tails more than 45 feet long. Tails helped them to keep their balance when running, especially those that walked on two legs. Velociraptors were not like raptors we see on the screen, but more like some sort of prehistoric chickens. Small, a little bit bigger than a turkey, two feet in height, probably had feathers, hollow bones just like birds, mostly loners. But they were probably among the smartest dinos. Their brain was big compared to their bodies. They were as intelligent as today's ostriches. The name Velociraptor means speedy thief. Stegosaurs had a pretty big body, spiky plates, and a tiny brain, the size of a walnut or lime. But at least it had its own air conditioner. Researchers found out its spikes were filled with veins that transferred blood and developed a theory that they were cooling its giant body that way. Dimorphodon was the flying reptile with a wingspan of 8 feet and multi-purpose teeth. Teeth in the upper jaw were longer, sharper, and better for catching food from the water. The teeth in the bottom jaw were better for holding the game in transit. One of the first potential dinosaur discoveries was in China, 3,500 years ago. No one knew about dinosaurs then, so people thought teeth they found could belong to dragons. The Hadrosaurus was a duck-billed dino with more than a thousand teeth. When they would fall off, it could grow new ones indefinitely. Dinosaurs' eggs were pretty big, some as big as beach balls. Now that's an omelet. The Baryonyx was a big fan of fish. Its name means a heavy claw, and it got it because of big extended claws that were pretty sharp and made up the thumb of each hand. When catching fish, they used the claws like spears. Mosasaurus, also popular in movies, was not quite the dinosaur but a marine lizard closely related to monitor lizards and snakes. Like a snake, it had jaws that could expand when swallowing the food. These creatures were speedy. They had a tail fin and flipper-like paddles instead of arms and legs. Researchers believe they had a weak sense of smell and poor perception of depth. So they had to develop a unique hunting technique, waiting for their snack to come up to the surface for some air. 